and I checked out the site. There's some really, really great looking books on there. Oh yeah, cool. Thank you. I'm trying to also um, like um, set up a podcast because uh, I do great interview with bands, and I thought uh, it's a shame that uh, only I can hear them, and then you know I have to edit them to you know have them in the magazines or whatever publication. But if I have them available uh, for as a you know as a video format, then it, it is great for you know for the band and for for the audience. I highly recommend it. Um creating a podcast was one of the best decisions I've made. And it's a, it's a great way for fans to consume interviews. I think, I mean, if it's in a book, it's a, if it's in a book, that's one thing, which I think is not, uh, not the norm and kind of cool, actually. Uh, I think, I think that that's actually very cool, but um, a podcast, it's just a different way of, it's a different way of connecting. And it's, I think it's a really good one. Excellent. So yes, shall we get to it or, Let's or, do it. or, or, or shall we just, uh, casually fade <laughs> Talk in? Talk about the... podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, I mean, one thing I wanted to ask, like, like off the bat, you guys have been, uh, like out of, out of, uh, making music for like 14 years. Mm -hmm. So what took so long? <laughs> Good question. Um, okay, so uh, the band has been inactive, but the members haven't. So I think that's a that's a key differentiator between, like, say that the band went on hiatus, left music, and then you know just decided we're having a midlife crisis and got the band back together. That would be a, one scenario, and that scenario does happen with reunions a lot, which is, um, which is part of how we set our goals for this one. But all, all of us have been in music this whole time. Like Sean, uh, vocalist, you know, he joined that band since Sanum, uh, with Joey Jordison. Uh, he was in Chimera for a while. Krim, he's in Septic Flesh. Jesse's already the orchestrator. He's always working for things like Riot Games and Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I started URM Academy and Riff Hard. So we've all been in the scene and super active. The reason that Doth itself as an entity uh, took that long was because when we went on hiatus, uh, I thought in my head, I guess erroneously, mm -hmm. that I could only do it with certain people. And mm -hmm. so I kept trying to restart it with certain people and it would, didn't work. Um, and then this time, what was different was I decided I was doing it no matter what, uh, with me or against me kind of thing. And, um, and when I told Sean or asked Sean if he was still interested, he said, of course, he's been waiting for the call for 13 years. And one of the first things that we talked about was, well, this has to happen no matter what. We're not getting younger. No more false starts. This time it's happening. And that means that if people want to do it with us, cool. If not, we'll just get new people. But it's happening. So how do you work together now with a new lineup? I mean, there are the musicians you just mentioned. They're obviously the super proficient and uh, very professional. So how do you work together? Because uh, I know that some of them are not based in the U.S., yeah, Krim and Rafael Trujillo are both in Austria. Uh, I mean, none of us are even in the same spot. I mean, oh, okay. I live in Milwaukee. Sean lives in Atlanta. David lives in Boston, and Jesse lives in Austin, Texas. So, I mean, if you if you were to superimpose that over a map of Europe, we basically would be in like four different countries, yeah, um, yeah, as yeah. far as distance goes. So, we're not a local. We're not local to each other, anyways. And what you just said, actually, that they're very proficient and very professional, that's how it's possible. Um, I mean, we didn't just pick them because they're professional and proficient, but that was definitely part of the criteria because we have to be able to do this at a distance. Um, thankfully, though, uh, they are their ideas are great, and there doesn't need to be a lot of uh, back and forth 
between between us. There's some, but it, things happen pretty quickly with these guys. Did you write the songs for this new album? Uh, well, we wrote them together, but I still like I still have my same role as before. Like I'm still the primary writer, and um, like I still some of the songs I wrote start to finish, but uh, I'm still the primary writer. However, what's different now is I really trust these guys musically, and you know, 13 years is a really long time to think about what went wrong. And so one of the things that uh, we really wanted to make sure of was that whoever we picked, they were already just organically in line with our vision musically to where, you know, we have similar tastes in a similar direction and, um, and that I trusted them creatively and musically so that we could incorporate their input more. And so with these guys, like for instance, if Krim says the song has gone too long in one direction, we need to change directions or it's too much of this. We need more of that or whatever. Uh, I, I will listen to him and respect that and uh, try to try to, so I try to understand what he's saying and, um, and make it better. And same, you know, if Jesse, says there like for instance there's not enough connective tissue there's a lot of good parts not enough connective tissue uh i'm going to listen to him because i trust him as a composer um and their ideas are just great so uh yeah i'm the primary writer but it's a lot more collaborative at this point and um, i'm not very good at uh, giving uh, you know assessing songs or pieces of music and I'm terrible at giving compliments however uh when I listen to Ascension and um, the other the other single X uh, an, an ending mm -hmm. oh I was hooked straight away oh thanks as in uh, you know sometimes it takes a few listen you know before you get into the song mm -hmm. but I, I like the first the first listen I was into it like I was into the song you know the guitar parts, uh, you know the the solos and the, the arrangements, and the, you use the word composed, so it's it's it feels like the songs were composed rather than just, you know, I write a few riffs and then you know you get the drums and whatever else. So how how did you get to this level, uh, considering that you guys are all over the place in terms of geographical location? Well, um. Well, thank you very much, um, first of all. And you are correct that the songs are more composed than just like heavy riffs thrown together. Mm -hmm. um, though I like some bands that yes. seems like they throw heavy riffs together. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not really what we do. Like ours is more um, tension release and themes and uh, variations on those themes and uh the thing is that we're we all speak the same language musically that's why it's possible so that's if we were to pick band members who didn't think like this it wouldn't have been possible but you know for instance Raphael also has a classical background okay. um like me so he's like he already thinks this way um it's it's just in the dna of how we think so we don't have to really explain these things to each other uh, we're already speaking the same language. Um, and the the thing that's really, really important, at least to me as a composer and songwriter, is that it's not just interesting the whole way through, but that it's not, uh, I guess, superficially interesting, like just flashy stuff uh, that um, will get your attention like a shiny object, but that doesn't have a purpose or meaning in the song so it's like everything has to have a, a purpose and everything needs to relate to everything else there's no no random stuff in there but at the same time uh you have to make sure that you're not getting too intellectual about it or like too like in your bubble and just doing things because because you could write a paper about it or something it's you have to be really really careful about that it still has to be 
emotionally resonant and still has to like evoke a feeling and express a feeling. So it's like the marriage of those two things. Often when I listen to extreme music, especially, you know, this kind of genre, it, it takes me, maybe because I'm getting older, I don't know, but it takes me a few lessons before I get into it. Like I really have to like sit down and, but you know, honestly, this, you know, this new songs that I've heard from you guys, I just got in straight away. It's, it's it hardly happens. Uh, I love the the sound of the guitar and the arrangements. Thanks. Anyway, um, how, how did you work with the with the with the with the lyrics? Was it something that uh, has been on, hanging on for the, the last thirteen years or or fourteen years, whatever, or or is it new new material in, in terms of content? So I think it's all new. Um, I think that uh, so like I don't I don't write all the lyrics. I more just will say that needs to change. Um, I'm not I'm not good with words. I, I like I, for me, music is very much outside of the realm of words and then words are added on. Um, so I don't really think like that, but I'm good at recognizing when they're bad um, or when something or when they're good or when something needs to change. So my role with the lyrics is usually just um, quality control and then making suggestions. Uh, the that all happened when uh, Sean went to the vocal producer, Andrew Wade, and they came up with a bunch of stuff together. And I know that the themes are just, we will, Sean and I will talk about what we're feeling in general during a certain time period. And then we'll just go do it. That That's, that's about it. But we've made a point of really not going into the archive for this record. Like we really wanted it to be, all new, all current, all the the freshest stuff. So, what are the main points of discussions, if you like? And let's see, because I under I mean I can obviously give my interpretation, but if, um, like, what do you normally sing about? Is it something uh, like it, you, it, you know that uh, is a central to the to your philosophy or? the way you see life we're kind of misanthropic i think um and the i guess the band focuses on negative aspects of human psyche uh and every album has been kind of like a different a different look at it uh for instance on our self-titled it was very if you consider it like you're pointing a weapon at something uh or or a magnifying glass however you want to look at it maybe you hate weapons you like science so you're pointing a magnifying glass at something uh like self-titled was pointed at ourselves for instance it was everything we hated about ourselves uh everything that we were dealing with um in this case uh we felt like we had overcome a lot to get to this point um neither of us were happy about the hiatus were very unhappy about it. Something that uh, caused me a lot of a lot of pain over the past decade, um, and we we were basically expressing a lot of uh, a lot of what we noticed about being lied to, being lied to, um, or being lied about in ways that hurt you or harm you, and that can be uh, you know ways that you lie to yourself and sabotage yourself or ways that other people will sabotage you. Um, but that's kind of the theme is lies used to hurt. And, sorry, I didn't mean to insist on this point, but why misanth misanthropic? Um, I, I think that there's a lot about people that we don't like. I mean, but, uh, uh, usually, at least me. I, I think usually misanthropic means something more like, towards all humanity right it i mean th i think there's probably a spectrum to it right um it's it's definitely not it's not towards all humanity in the way that like an incel would be or something um it, it's more like if you're not careful let's put it this way mm -hmm. uh if you're not careful 
and you're only looking at the bad stuff, you can um, you can really get into a state of mind where you believe that it's all bad and that people are all bad. Um, and so actually part of like putting this into art is kind of getting that out of uh, out of the heads, just getting yourself out of that headspace. Because uh, really, uh, what I actually believe is that it's how you interpret it. And if you want to see all the good in the world, you just have to choose to see it. But um, some people, myself included, have this autopilot in my head that just always goes to the worst possible conclusion. Like if something something bad happens, it's I, I immediately just jump to it's the worst thing possible. Uh, it just in terms of assumptions and uh, it's not a good thing. It's something that I try to work on. But uh, when if you aren't careful and you uh, and you don't make the effort to see the good, you will end up tricking yourself into thinking that it's all bad. So, um, so I think it's a tendency more so than like a worldview, if that makes sense. Was it like a, a, an event in your life uh, or maybe events that uh, sort of um, lead you to this direction or? Quite a few. I've got a few, okay. Because uh, I, I only, to be honest with you, I only heard about this sort of philosophy, if you like, from the metal scene, like outside of the metal scene, I never heard of the term uh, misanthropic, for example. Yeah. Well, I mean, to make this kind of music, like if, if it's an honest expression, right. Um, I, something had to have happened now. The, I think that there is a misconception about people who make this kind of music as being like evil or, really messed up because how can you actually work with other people and have a successful project that gets things done if you're that messed up so mm -hmm. like th there's it, it there's a it's all within um the realm of you know expression i think and okay. not so much in the realm of we're start a movement to uh yes, yes, <laughs> to yes, cleanse yes. the world or something mm -hmm. so but um but i think that yeah if if you're drawn to this kind of music if it connects with you um i mean i don't think that someone has to do the work of trying to figure out why they connect with something like this but let's just be real this kind of music is uh is pretty dark it's pretty dark it's pretty intense um and it, probably there's a reason for why it speaks to certain people right and usually something went wrong in their childhood at some point in time and they got traumatized somehow and then this kind of music speaks to them i think on there's another possibility that they're like an adrenaline junkie mm -hmm. um and they need that overstimulation but then also that that can also be a trauma response that happens uh, if you get traumatized pretty young, you then need overstimulation in order for your brain to just feel normal. So um, I think I think that is why you'll see this in the metal scene more than you'll see it in like the uh, you know, the electronic clubbing scene or something. Yes, yes. That's for people wanting to have a good time. I mean, yes. I mean, uh, from my side, when I uh, think of new new ideas for a book or or whatever within the metal spectrum. I I never not run out of ideas or or, or topics. There's okay. there's so much content. There's so much uh, exploration. Uh, whether it be um, mythology or history or themes of horror, and so it's always great that. Um, I feel it's great that uh, as, as a culture, as a scene, uh, it's so uh, vibrant in, in that sense. But at the same time, I feel like uh, a lot of the time there's a lot of negativity. Maybe maybe it's just, uh, as you said, like an artistic expression rather than uh, 
you know, being negative. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think? Uh, I think that there's a spectrum where um, there's some people who connect with it who uh, can't control themselves or uh, it really, it's not just an expression of, um, you know, trying to work through some emotional pain but it's more, but it goes more into how they like to behave. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very big scene. There's, I think it's over a few million people strong and mm -hmm. there's all kinds of subgenres, as you know, it's like, it's so varied. So with that many people, there's going to be all types. Uh, and so there's definitely um, a corner of the metal scene that's, uh, super aggressive super negative violent all those things but i think that overall overall it's more it's more just everybody connects with this kind of music for their own reason um those who make it though i think whatever drives you to make this kind of music i think that's that's really like it has to be coming from a place of some sort of pain like this, this isn't music made by, for, by like happy people. Yes. Yes. I mean, of course there's a com commercial element to it, but uh, it, I, in my opinion, it's very minimal. There's, a, there's a lot of effort to, to make it like really special and really like a, like, like art is art is not for commercial purpose. Yeah, but the, I, I mean, think, with the, the commercial side of it, um, a lot of it happens once some a band starts to experience some success and they realize that they could actually do this, like mm -hmm. only this. I mean, and at that point, the the commercial side starts to come in so that they can keep it going and so that they don't have to work a job anymore which I think is a really noble purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, like I, I feel like when people talk badly about bands who uh, have gone more commercial, I think they're missing the point completely. The reason they went commercial is so that they could keep making music and not have to go back to the real world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I think, the most noble purpose of all is uh, is to be able to do that or to try to do that. And especially if you're getting some evidence from the world that it, there's potential for it. I mean, who would not, who wouldn't seize that? I think, I mean, there's some who start that way from the beginning, but this is the wrong kind of music to start, to start off that way because the chances of success are so small. Uh, so I know we took a little derail, uh, okay. but, but um, yeah, I think it's 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 nice to talk about these sort of things. And um, going back to the album, uh, I love uh, the monochrome feel uh, of uh, the artwork. Um, does the artwork have any sort of uh, like special meaning in terms of symbolism? You know, the way the illustrations is sort of set up. Yeah, a little bit. Um, so the artist, his name's Adrian Baxter. He's also okay, in the he's, UK. Yes, he's, he's phenomenal. Um, and this is our first time working with him, uh, but he, he was the artist we wanted to work with for this record, which is really cool. Kind of like when getting the new band members, everybody was my first choice. As far as the artist goes, Adrian was our first choice. And the reason that we wanted to go with Adrian is because he's very good with, um, I, he's very good with using, uh, symmetry with using symbols um, with having very very complex yet simple uh, pieces where you it's hard to it's hard to explain really until you see it but if you zoom in on anything he does there's a ton of intricate 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 detail um, but the uh, the actual the actual things that are on the art or that the art is showing is pretty simple and to the point so you like always know what you're looking at um 
but it's super super layered um and uh the the only little bit of symbolism on there or it's not even symbolism we just wanted to have our Boris Boris deer that we've been using as the band symbol front and center uh just because it's our first album back in a long time and uh you know sometimes reunion albums are hit or miss mm -hmm. there's been a lot of reunions where people get bummed out um you know we really want to make a statement with this one um for ourselves and for old school fans i think people who are just finding us for the first time won't won't know that that's the symbol we've been using uh this whole time so but for someone who's been waiting for this for over a decade it's kind of like a message to them that it's the it's what you've been waiting for um and as far as the monochrome uh i don't like color i mean i do like colorful art uh but for us i i i like black and white or black and white with one color i i like it to have a very simple um and stark kind of look to it um uh, what are your thoughts about the the, con the controversy around the ai art i know it's been um quite uh quite a thing you know with the d side releasing the new album and pestilence as well so yeah you have you have you seen those those covers and what i've are seen them you know, and I've messed around with Mid Journey and all that stuff too. Um, and I know that inside of different programs, there's now AI assist tools. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm familiar. I'm familiar with the AI thing, um, and it's it's complicated. It's complicated. Uh, so, because obviously, like, we hired a real artist and intend to keep hiring real artists. I still haven't seen a computer come up with an idea. Um, yeah, I've seen, uh, computers do some incredible things based off of prompts you give them. Mm -hmm. Um, and not, I'm not talking about where they pull it from and the whole ethical side of it, just mm -hmm. the pure creation side. Um, yep. it, it's really, it's really, it's like a cool novelty, um, how, what it can create based off of what you tell it but i have never seen it make like a, a piece of art that makes me think anything more than wow that's technically impressive even with a what's it called sora the video version or this new video one that looks amazing i mean it looks amazing but it still looks like a cut screen from a video game and um and the thing that's that is impressive is how technically good it looks but I still haven't seen it come up with a creative idea. And, um, and so that's my overall critique of the AI art is yes, it's technically super impressive. Obviously anyone who says it's not is lying. It's very impressive and the technology is amazing, but it's just a computer. It's just a computer that's interpreting what you tell it and pulling from all over the internet to try to create its interpretation of what you said. It's not a human who is going to get inspiration and do something actually original, not yet at least. Um, and so for that reason, uh, like I don't see why I'd want to use it. Um, mm -hmm. Now I think that practically speaking uh, the artists should be scared um but i don't think they should be terrified uh same way that uh i have a little bit of a perspective on this because in production in music production um you know i started a company called urm academy where we teach people how to produce metal um and uh we we have like the best producers coming on and showing how they mix the best bands and then we let people download the tracks licensed from the labels. So if it says you're going to learn how to mix Lamb of God from Machine, it's the actual Lamb of God tracks for the song Redneck. And you can download them and do your own practice mixes with that. And um, 
that coupled with how inexpensive home recording technology is, when we first started the company, lots of people thought that we were going to destroy their jobs because this thing that was very much only uh, only done by a chosen few who had the knowledge was suddenly going to be uh, able to be done by the masses and producers would be out of out of a, a job and it would be terrible but it's almost 10 years later and that hasn't happened the only thing that's happened is that these really really bad local studios that ripped off bands went out of business a whole lot of and maybe some huge overpriced studios uh that are like a relic of an older time went out of business but all the best producers they're still working and they're working now more than ever probably because people who will go to our site and get some like home interface they realize uh they realize how difficult it is to actually produce um and they recognize how good how good that top level of producers are so anyways, people were saying that it was going to destroy production and it was going to make it impossible to make a living being a producer, an engineer, a mixer. And like I said, we're going to be 10 next year. And okay. that's just false. Now, it's not one-to-one -one with AI art um, because it's not people replacing people. But I still think that just like with production, there's always going to be people who want the um, the insight and the uh, the output of the best, uh, the best in their area, the best in the world, the best in their scene. Um, and I, I just don't have any any faith that a computer is anywhere close to delivering that kind of creativity. It's just I just don't see it happening. What but maybe bad artists who or artists who like rip people off um might have trouble because if you have bands like local bands with very limited budgets who can only afford someone who's really terrible or they could get ai to do it for free they're going to choose the ai and that's just the reality of the situation um if it's between paying 150 dollars for some really really bad cover or zero for one that looks really cool they're going to go with zero for the one that looks really cool so i think that there's probably going to be the lower tier of artists that gets decimated by the ai um i mean that's that that's probably going to happen i think there's also in my opinion an element of creative direction like for example Going back to the cover from the D side, I played around with Mid Journey, obviously. Like the cover that, in the game for me, is terrible. Like you can do better with, even with, with Mid Journey. Like there's also like a, a creative direction that maybe comes with experience. And I'm not for saying sure. that, uh, I'm not saying that uh, Glenn Benton has no experience. Absolutely not. Maybe that's what he wanted. But maybe that you know he was happy with it, and and uh, that's that, and there's that. But you can do better, even within uh, mid journey. I mean, well, the, that's cover, the same it, thing. It's... That's the same thing with production. When you have bands who who you know they watch our videos for like three years and then think they can mix and they do their best, and it's still not anywhere compared to like Jens Bogren or Andy Sneap or something um yeah like it could be better but it it's still i mean i have a hard time believing that it's it would be that like it's hard to explain what inspired means you just know it when you see it um it, i haven't seen it yet with mid journey or any of those okay. even with people who are really good at using it um not saying it won't ever happen but uh what i've seen with mid journey was when someone really knows how to use it well they get really cool looking stuff uh, or like 
stuff that's like, wow, I can't believe that's AI. That that usually ends up being my thought is like, wow, I can't believe that's not a photograph or something. Um, we we're working with a uh, with a band right now to to release um, a book, uh, an old band. I'm not gonna say who now because we haven't announced it yet. Uh, and for their book, they used the um, AI as well as Photoshop and other other editing programs, and the the quality, and also the the relationship between what the artist has done as a sketch, and then uh, and then what they've done they put the the sketch into AI and other editing software, and the quality is just stunning. Like, mm -hmm. is objectively speaking, it's, it's just really, really good. Also, because what they've done, they're taking a sketch and then rendering it with, uh, you know, with color and uh, um, shades and all of that. And the quality, honestly, I was blown away. And I've seen everything in terms of visual arts. I've been doing this now for 10 years. Um. So yeah, maybe, maybe maybe like is a combination of different elements yeah. that um, you know different tools, and also you know you need to have an eye and experience to get a really good out outcome. You know, like a good piece. Absolutely, I think what you're saying um, is very valid, and that will be that'll be more likely how it really ends up working. Um, is people will use it as one among many tools uh, to help get to their end result. You know, just like with production, you have tools now that do things that 10 years ago we couldn't imagine that you can still ruin a recording with them. It's not going to just make it great for you. You have to know exactly how to use it, how much to use it, when to use it, all those things. Um, and you use it in conjunction with a thousand other things that you're doing. Um, I imagine that in in that type of scenario where it's based off of a human sketch and there's other tools being used, the AI is just one out of an arsenal. That's I, I see that being the actual path forward. I don't see mid journey or whatever comes after mid journey suddenly replacing artists. Like it just doesn't seem it just doesn't seem realistic yeah I, I agree i mean if i want to if i want to buy a painting i buy a painting that has nothing to do with the ai yep or, or, or with the technology in general isn't it <laughs> it's not <laughs> yeah exactly um right um we've gone through a lot um uh, i don't have any more questions um do you have any questions for me um yeah uh what who are some artists that are, in your opinion, really um, noteworthy or that people should check out that they might not know about yet? Um, like, like graphic artists or like mm -hmm. visual artists. Yeah. Um, I have a few artists that I regularly work with, and uh, I think they're they're very unique, and also how they they make something from from the ideas like we, we released um, uh, two books two ai books from an artist called dougie pledge pledger and what people got pissed off is that it because he's a real artist like he knows how to draw properly mm -hmm. and he makes art it it, it 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 did the the puppets for one of the tools video oh, the band cool. tool uh, so so you know he knows what he's doing in terms of creativity but people got pissed off because an artist used the ai like like dave mckin dave mckin released a book using ai and people just lose, lost their their shit over it for some for some reason um um so i i really like him because the way he used ai to speed up his creative process. And if he would have done this on his own or even with the help of others, it would have it would have taken years. Like it wouldn't be feasible. Yep. Um so and I think now I, 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 sorry, I just wanted to say one thing. I think when people 
get mad about AI, most of the time they don't even know what they're talking about. Like no, I, they don't under they don't know the nuance of like what you just described. But the thing is, and there's a very legitimate concern about these programs stealing work from other artists, mm -hmm. which obviously is not uh, something which uh, I condone. It's, it's really bad. But I think once we 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 go past that, then there are ways of dealing with these things, you know, with with a bit of ethics and the legal the legal ramification. Once we go past this, the way that artists can work with the help of different tools, like advanced tools, what the artists can do is like, I think the next frontier of, of creativity, because what that gets done, especially this one book called uh, Wrong in the Head, he created all these stories, all these characters, all on his own. He wrote the stories. Uh, so he has a bit of a comedy sort of twisted, uh, uh, there's a twisted element to it really sick really like really twisted stuff and he did everything on his own and the book is is fantastic uh, and uh, i had to take it off off the side because people were just uh i don't think people are ready for it yeah, that that's what it is mm -hmm. yeah i mean people and technology man uh they're they're scared of it i think part of it is They've watched too many movies. Um, but another part of it also is just there's this natural human um, fear of evolution. And, you know, we noticed the same thing in in metal with uh, drum triggers, for <laughs> instance. There's people who think it's cheating. They don't even know what it does. They don't know that it makes it harder like it makes it harder. The drummer has to be better in order to use triggers because you can hear everything clearly. So if they're playing sloppy, you're going to hear it. Whereas without the triggers, you just hear a rumble. So um, at least people who say that drummers who play with triggers are cheating, they don't even understand what they're talking about. They're just scared of the future, basically. Um, it, they, It's one of the funniest things when you hear using triggers is cheating it's actually actually it's way more revealing way more revealing if you hear somebody playing triggers and they sound really tight that is really impressive um the faster you get so uh, you know you, same thing with using computers for recording when computers became a thing and people started moving off a of tape there was a whole movement uh, saying that computers are for games you know, music is art. Uh, we shouldn't, you know, it's like sacrilegious to confuse the two. And, uh, you know, then it became digital amplifiers instead of tube amplifiers. Mm -hmm. You know, any single time there's an advancement, there's a group of people who will cry about it. And eventually, uh, eventually the world moves towards the more evolved version of whatever tool it is we're talking about. I mean, on, on a personal level, uh, I, I will always prefer uh, like uh, creative outputs, which are handcrafted. I mean, that, that, that will be always on my top of the list in terms of personal preference and how I like to connect with art. But at the same time, I cannot ignore uh, different ways of expressing yourself. Like now we have uh, the AI. When uh, electronic music came out, <laughs> was the same argument. Or mm -hmm. when, or, or with DJs, you know, DJs, people say, oh, DJs are not real musicians. Maybe they're not, but it's a different way of, of, a, of, a, of a human being ex to express what, the, what they want and how they want to connect with people. Um, I, I like electronic music, I like dance music. And I know it's not uh, something that uh, the metal scene. Uh, <laughs> I know there's a big divide between between the two, but I don't care. Um, no, there's some really good electronic music, but I but but I think that the example you're using of electronic music is a very overt 
example because it's obviously electronic music it's obviously done on a computer yes, yes. there's now there's a lot of digital tools that you hear all over metal records where you cannot distinguish the difference between the analog version and the digital version and this it's been tested where people do blind a b's all the time and always get it wrong you cannot differentiate between the two like a digital guitar amp versus a real amp people say they can but the moment you do a blind a b test you realize they can't tell the difference just like they can't tell the difference between a high quality mp3 and a wave file um they just can't and uh i think in in the realm of uh replacing older tools that's that's we're getting to a point where you can't tell the difference but i think with like electronic music that's a little bit different because the whole i mean it's called electronic music it's it's supposed to sound like electronic yeah it's, it's different i mean if i want to listen to traditional instruments i listen to traditional instruments oh for sure you know if i want to listen to a psychedelic trance I don't expect the psychedelic, psychedelic trance to be formed with guitars and 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 the and the violin. No, of course not. Of is, course it, not. is it a different thing altogether? Is it no, but I think experience? sometimes people hear metal and they'll think that uh, it has to be done with like real amplifiers or something, um, as opposed to computer plugins. But what makes these rules? Musicians, they do, you know, they they should feel feel free to do how they. I agree. Yeah, you know. I think it's, it's just like people a... on the internet. <laughs> I, um, I really think it's just people on the internet. Yeah, no, I mean, even before the internet, uh, uh, when the era, I keep making this example when Era Maiden released Seven Son of Seven Son with the, with the keyboards, there was like a, an uproar. Oh, a metal band using keyboards. I can imagine. Like, so what? <laughs> So so what? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anyway, um, thanks, thanks, man. This has uh, been a great conversation. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for watching this podcast. If you enjoyed this interview, please like, share, and subscribe. Tell your friend, your family, and your cat, and stay awesome. Don't forget to check out our store at www. Thank you.